हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा It's Tuesday and we are trying to focus on some good news. Inflation in India is at a 2 year low. Industrial production is up. The risk of recession is near zero. This is not the story elsewhere though. So how did India buck the trend and what does the global picture look like? We'll discuss that. Also India is sharing a public good with the rest of the world. Saudi Arabia and Bahrain may soon join the list of countries that have adopted India's UPI. We'll talk about that. and India's fintech revolution also look at the controversy triggered by Twitter founder Jack Dorsey he says the government of India threatened his company during the farmer protests 2 years ago we'll tell you about India's response and also separate facts from allegations all of that and more coming up the headlines first the war in ukraine intensifies russia strikes ukraine's krivyi Kiev says it downed 10 out of 14 missiles launched by Moscow. Russia says it has captured several German Leopard tanks and US armored vehicles and Kiev is now eyeing Australian F-18 fighter jets to boost its air power. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is in Beijing amid China's growing ambitions to play facilitator in the Israel-Palestine peace talks. This is Abbas's fifth official visit to China as Beijing continues to challenge US influence in West Asia. UK police locks down Nottingham. Three people were found dead in the central English city. A van also tried to mow down three others. Police suspect the two incidents are linked. One person has been arrested. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak condoles the deaths. India and Pakistan brace for cyclone Bipar Joy. Over 40,000 people evacuated across both countries. India's Met Department says the storm will make landfall on Thursday near the port of Jakau in Gujarat. And will football club PSG lose another star player after Messi? Kylian Mbappe says he will not extend his contract beyond next year. It will be a major blow to the French club. They were looking to the 24-year-old striker to fill Messi's void. If you've been to India or live here, you're familiar with the wonders of UPI, a three-letter phenomenon that has transformed daily lives. You pull out your phone. scan a qr code and make a payment as simple as that and now india is sharing it with the rest of the world upi is all set to become india's next big export some countries in the neighborhood already use it soon gulf countries like saudi arabia and bahrain may also have upi india is talking to them to enable bank to bank transfers and cross border transactions via upi reports say the talks are in early stages and that the gulf countries are showing a lot of interest This will help Indians in the region, the Indian diaspora. We're talking about more than seven million Indians. They regularly send money home every year. Non-resident Indians or NRIs in the Gulf send back eighty-nine billion dollars. That's sixty-five percent of India's total remittances. So far, they've been doing it through banks. But imagine making these transfers from their phones with minimum charges. And yes, charges would apply. You see, UPI transactions within India are free. But if you make a cross-border transaction, then there will be a fee, anywhere between three to six dollars, according to one report. And it may be worth the cost, given what UPI has been able to do in India. UPI stands for Unified Payments Interface, but it's now become a ubiquitous payments interface. It's everywhere. Go to the remotest parts of India and you'll most likely find vendors with QR codes. Go to the busiest parts of your city and the people you see may not be carrying a photo ID but almost all of them will have a UPI ID. It's an instant payment system. It runs mostly on a mobile phone. It is used to transfer money in real time just by scanning a code. and its success at home is driving its global expansion upi has some clear strengths the first of course is convenience it has disrupted payments in india you don't have to carry cash anymore the technology is easy to use all payment apps support it and all major banks have adopted it this interoperability has fueled the high adoption upi's second strength is its reliability and like always i have some numbers In January this year about 8 billion transactions happened through UPI 8 billion do you know how much money was transferred nearly 200 billion dollars 
Going by the Indian government's assessment, India does more digital transactions than the US, the UK, Germany and France combined. The digital payment transactions amounted to $1.5 trillion annualized basis. And that is if you compare the total of US digital transactions, UK, Germany, France, combine the four, multiply by four. Four times bigger. That's massive. And this ecosystem is growing. The UPI is used by close to 300 million individuals and 50 million merchants. This proves how resilient the system is. So there is convenience, there is scale, and there is reliability. But the biggest benefit of UPI is financial inclusion. I have another statistic for you. In 2022, UPI transactions in semi-urban and rural stores skyrocketed. By how much? A record 650%, 650%. And these are towns and cities where until recently a lot of citizens did not even have a bank account. Today they are paying with their phones. The world is taking notice of this success story. Many countries want to adopt India's UPI. The trend in fact began with Bhutan. Bhutan adopted the UPI in 2021. Last year, Nepal joined the club. So did the UAE. Indian travellers to the UAE were allowed to pay through their UPI-linked accounts. Now, going by one estimate, at least 23 countries support UPI in some form or the other, and the story gets better. Recently, NRIs have been given greater access to UPI. Indians who, who do not reside in India, non-resident Indians, they can use their international numbers to send money. As of now, this facility is available in 10 countries and regions. Singapore, Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, Oman, Qatar, the United States, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and the United Kingdom. These countries support this arrangement for now. The list is expected to grow. India launched the UPI as a public utility and now it is sharing it with the rest of the world. All that fintech magic depends on one thing. India's domestic economic health. And there's good news on that front. Two important economic indicators are looking solid. Inflation and industrial production. As central bankers would say, let's deal with inflation first. India's consumer price index fell to 4.25% in May. And that's a 25-month low. Inflation was around 7% in May last year. Now it's 4.25%. Now the Reserve Bank of India has a tolerance ban for inflation, sort of like a preferred range. And the upper limit here is 6%, which means at 4.25, India's current inflation is well within that range, well below that 6% upper limit. Now look at other emerging markets. In Argentina, inflation is almost 98%. In Turkey, 50%. Iran, 42%. Egypt, 21%. These countries are reeling under higher inflation. What about the developed world? The cost of living is already high in these countries and inflation figures are a mixed bag. The numbers have cooled off in some countries like Canada, the US, France and Italy. But others are not out of the woods. Like the United Kingdom. Their retail inflation in the UK, 6.8%. In Germany, it's 6.2%. And this has a direct impact on economic output and health. But more on that later. For now, let's look at the second indicator, factory output. It is measured using something called IIP, Index of Industrial Production, IIP. It had fallen to 1.1% in March this year, but in April, it rebounded. The latest number is 4.2%. And this represents a notable increase for India. If you rewind to late last year, factory output was in the dumps. It was negative 4% in October 2022, meaning the output shrank. So the latest data shows a positive trajectory. And how is the rest of the world faring? China's industrial output was up 5.6% in April. But there's a catch. The market expectation was much higher for China. More than 10% in fact. So the pace of China's industrial recovery has been slower than expected. Could that be an opportunity for India? It could, but it a lot depends on the RBI. That's India's central bank. For booming growth, you need to cut interest rates. You need to make loans cheaper. But is the RBI ready for that? Most experts say it's not. I mentioned that 6% inflation is the upper tolerance limit. Right now, it's well under that, 4.25%. But the RBI will look for a sustained dip, perhaps below 4%.
It will also look for clues from the U.S. Federal Reserve, that's America's central bank, the U.S. Fed. It is still hiking interest rates. Once the Americans stop, other banks are expected to follow. So India, you could say, is on the starting line, ready to begin the sprint. It's all about waiting for the buzzer. But some of the other sprinters are nowhere in the picture. In fact, they may not even turn up. Take a look at this map. It shows three sets of countries, those already in recession, those at risk of recession, and those expected to escape. Germany is already in recession. They've had two quarters of negative GDP growth, which is technically recession. Next in line could be the United Kingdom, the UK. They have a 75% chance of recession this year. New Zealand has 70%, the US 65%, Australia 50%, and Canada 60%. What about India? As things stand, there is a 0% chance of recession in India. Saudi Arabia too is doing well, just 5% chance. China is at 12%, Brazil at 15%. So the big takeaway is this, the developed world is not out of the woods, but India appears to be safe. How did that happen? How did India buck the global trend? Well, you can't point at one specific reason for that. It's a combination of many policy choices really. We look at three of them. For starters, cheap crude from Russia. That has really worked. By not taking sides in the war, New Delhi got good deals. And that's one reason why inflation is under control. The second reason is related to the pandemic. Do you remember what most governments did during the pandemic? They announced stimulus packages. And most of them were cash transfers. The US, for instance, spent about $250 billion on it. American citizens got checks up to $1,200. I'm sure it helped them, but there's a downside to such policies. More cash supply leads to more inflation. It's Economics 101. But India tried another route. Things like free food distribution, loan concessions, more investment in pandemic-hit sectors. Perhaps that cashless approach worked for India. Because the biggest problem for developed economies is inflation. They have controlled it with interest hikes. But what happens if they pause? For all we know, it could shoot right to back up. And that's where India is better placed. The RBI paused interest hikes back in April, yet inflation is sliding every month. What happens next is mostly out of India's hand. One is, of course, the global economy. The other is monsoons and El Nino. That's the third thing that has worked in India's favor so far. Some good old luck. Remember this guy? You can blame him for most of the problems on social media. That's Jack Dorsey. He founded Twitter, sold it, and is now recounting the good old days. This time he spoke about India. He was talking about the relationship between Twitter and governments and how some governments tried to muzzle critics. Jack Dorsey says India was one of them. In fact, let me quote from what he said. It manifested in ways such as, we will shut Twitter down in India, which is a very large market for us. We will raid the homes of your employees, which they did. We will shut down your offices if you don't follow suit. And this is India, a democratic country. This is what Jack Dorsey said. Let me give you some context. Dorsey is specifically talking about the farmers' protest in India. It happened some two years back. He says the Indian government threatened Twitter then. Block our critics or we will shut you down. That's apparently what the government said. And how has the government responded to these claims? With a defiant rejection. Listen in to Union Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Jack Dorsey was the CEO of Twitter uh, during a very, very dubious period in Twitter's uh, history. What he has said is an outright lie, and I have said that uh, publicly and I am reiterating it again. Twitter is a company that uh, believed that it was not necessary for it to comply with Indian law. It believed that it did not have to comply with Indian law and made up its rules as it went along. The minister also said Twitter was being used to spread misinformation, plus it was refusing to comply with Indian laws. You may remember that showdown. Twitter fought against India's IT rules for two years. They wanted to operate in India, but they did not want to follow the Indian law. It was only in 2022 that they accepted the rules. The government also says no one went to jail, nor was Twitter shut down. So what's the truth here? Let's look at the facts. Did the government of India ask Twitter to take down accounts? Yes, they did. What kind of accounts and how many? 
around 1,200 accounts linked to Khalistan mostly. And Twitter did comply at first. But later on, they made a U-turn. They restored some accounts claiming freedom of expression. Now, do you see the problem here? Twitter decided what was permissible and what was not. Not the court, not the government of the country. Twitter decided to take that call. Now, I know Twitter is supposed to be a company, but that's not how Jack Dorsey imagined it. Let me quote from his words. I don't believe anyone should own or run Twitter. It wants to be a public good at a protocol level, not a company. So Dorsey wanted Twitter to be a public good. Well, that means following the rules. That also means holding yourself to government standards. Twitter did not do that in 2021. And now two years later, Dorsey alleges intimidation. He says his team was threatened. Frankly, it's a he-said-she-said said situation. The government claims Dorsey's track record discredits him, which to an extent is true. I'll give you another example. Do you remember the 2021 capital riots in the US? Twitter was quick to crack down during the riots. No government request was needed. Twitter acted on its own. They deplatformed then-President Donald Trump. But fun fact, the Taliban continued to be welcome on Twitter. Tells you about their double standards. My point is not about Trump, really, or the Taliban. It's about Twitter's myopia. When things happen in the U.S., they're quick to act or react. But when similar things happen elsewhere, they drag their feet. All U.S. tech giants face this problem. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, even latest tech products like ChatGPT. Recently, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman was in India. OpenAI is the company behind ChatGPT. You know what Altman said? It's hopeless for India to create something like chat GPT. Those were the words he used. Hopeless, he said. And it was sa the same with Twitter and TikTok. Someone else developed these platforms and we adopted them. Perhaps it's time to change that trend. We keep talking about our IT sector, how India can be a tech superpower and a talent hub, how the sector is expected to be worth $100 billion by 2025. It already employs around 5 million people and yet... India rarely leads the tech race. We are among the biggest markets for American tech companies, but why aren't we building our own? Is it lack of ambition or lack of government support or something else? Well, whatever be the reason, it calls for introspection because companies like Twitter will never serve India's interests. Their CEOs will dress up to be grilled by U.S. senators, but they won't answer questions in India. They won't want to comply with laws in India. They would much rather fling allegations Two years later. Let's shift our attention to Europe. The skies above the continent look like a war zone. For the next two weeks, 250 military aircraft and 10,000 soldiers will dominate these skies. They're practicing how to respond to a Russian attack. So what really is happening in Europe? NATO drills, the largest ever, the biggest air exercise in NATO's history. Germany is playing host. A total of 25 countries are taking part. This includes friends of NATO as well, countries like Japan. Japan has joined as an observer. And Sweden, which is still waiting to join the NATO. And what are these troops pre preparing for? A potential war with Russia. Or should I say, another war with Russia, considering they're already fighting one. This exercise is quite deliberately taking place at a level that is not intended to contribute to escalation. It is, of course, a massive presence. It is also important to send a clear signal to Russia. So NATO is sending a message to Russia. Although the exercise is not a, a new idea, really. It was first thought of in the year 2018, four years after Russia annexed Crimea. These drills were meant to be a response. It took them four years to think of a response. And in the end, they chose to junk the plan. Then Russia invaded Ukraine, and more than a year into the war, NATO has finally come together to conduct an air drill. Full marks for promptness. From my perspective, we are sending a strong message here that we care about our security. And that, I think, is something that is needed more than ever since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Germany is leading these drills. But what's the point of this exercise beyond making a point to Moscow? Testing and maintaining interoperability. 
In simple English, they're trying to see if they can fight as one force against Russia. The focus of the drills is Eastern Europe. In the next few days, the warplanes will practice maneuvers. They will fly towards the east every day, towards countries like Romania and Estonia. They're close to Russia and the war in Ukraine. And NATO is trying to show Moscow, and perhaps itself, how quickly it can deploy if the battle in Ukraine spills over. The implications are clear. They're preparing for a larger conflict. Eastern Europe has been militarized. The last pretenses of neutrality have been shed. You see, for decades, Brussels has avoided a conflict. And now they're actively gearing up for one. Europe is spending big money on arms. Again, I have some numbers. Europe's arms imports have increased by 47% in the recent past. Military spending is breaking records. Last year, Europe spent 13% more on its armies. By December 2022, Europe's defense spending crossed $200 billion for the first time ever. A part of this is going towards buying arms for Ukraine. But leading European nations, which profess neutrality for the longest time, are also arming themselves. And guess who they're turning to for the weapons? the United States of America, it has got meaty orders from its European friends. Germany is one of the biggest buyers. It has ordered 35 F-35 aircraft. The deal is worth over $8 billion. Then we have Poland. Ahead of Russia's invasion, Poland ordered 250 M1 Abrams tanks. How much did, they, did it cost them? Around $6 billion. The United Kingdom asked for a missile defense radar. The price tag was 700 million. Around the same time, Spain placed an order too. They wanted choppers from America. So the trend is quite clear. Europe feels threatened. It is arming itself and playing war games. A larger attack from Russia may become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Over in Canada, trouble is mounting for Mr. Teflon. I'm talking about Justin Trudeau. He has a way of slipping out of trouble, but this time his people want answers. They're disappointed with his handling of Canada, specifically how China meddled in Canadian elections. Some background first. Canada had intelligence that China tried to interfere in their elections, not once but twice, in 2019 and then again in 2021. But this information was never made public. The government knew about it, but they refused to act. In 2022, the intelligence got out. Several Canadian media houses published it. They accused China of trying to favor the Liberal Party. That's Justin Trudeau's group. You can see what it looks like. China tried to meddle in favor of Trudeau's party. He knew about it, but he did not act. Imagine you're the opposition in Canada. Would you let it slide? So Trudeau was forced to set up a one-man committee, a one-man committee. Last week, its report was submitted. Do you know what it said? No public inquiry necessary. The report claimed that Trudeau's government did not knowingly ignore intelligence, whatever that means. But Canadians are far from happy. Here's what an opinion poll found. 55% of Canadians say Trudeau's response was poor or very poor. 24% say it was average and just 14% say it was good. Frankly, these numbers are not surprising. Elections are beating the beating heart of every democracy. No citizen can accept election interference, especially not from a rival state like Canada. And here, Justin Trudeau knew about it. He ignored intelligence on Chinese interference, knowingly or unknowingly, doesn't really matter. It's not a luxury that politicians really have. But our story doesn't end here. This opinion poll was taken before Friday last week. And since then, a lot has happened. Trudeau's one-man committee resigned on Friday. The opposition said he was too close to the Prime Minister, so things are not looking good for Justin Trudeau. The question is, what happens next? The opinion polls may only focus on the election meddling claim, but the results show a bigger story, the growing mistrust of China. Around 55% of Canadians want to decrease trade with China. Only 18% have a positive opinion of Beijing. What does that tell you? The average Canadian does not like China. But do they like India? Around 41% Canadians have positive opinions of India. To give you some context, the US only scored 54% on the same poll. So 41 is not a bad number at all. But tell that to the government. Trudeau's government is intent on sabotaging relations, it seems. Again, knowingly or unknowingly. 
Look at all the incidents this month. First, Canada's national security advisor accused India of interference. She clubbed India with countries like Russia and Iran. Then you had this hateful tableau. It glorified the assassination of Indira Gandhi. But Canada says it's not a hate crime. So let me sum up Trudeau's politics for you. He gives China a free pass, all the evidence and public opinion be damned. But he also shelters Indian separatists. Such mindless politics will impact bilateral ties. In fact, Foreign Minister S. Jayashankar warned of it. He said such actions are not good for relations. But don't expect Justin Trudeau to act. He's consumed by vote bank politics. In his mind, seeking action against separatists is interference, but trying to rig elections is not. It's a logic only Mr. Teflon can explain. Perhaps his free pass to China will backfire electorally. Then you can be sure of a public inquiry. Our next story is from Thailand. It's a Buddhist kingdom, but its southern region has a Muslim-majority Malay population. This region has been home to a long-standing separatist movement and violent insurgencies. In recent years, peace talks have been on. But now there is fresh talk of self-determination, even an independence referendum. The outgoing government and the military have launched a crackdown. Their critics say they're exaggerating the risks, though. Our next report takes a closer look at this conflict. Thailand's ruling military establishment is tense. Outgoing Prime Minister Prayut chan -Ocha has alerted the country's National Security Council. He wants them to take action against a group of activists and politicians. Why? For holding a seminar called Self-Determination. What was it about? Separatism, apparently. At least, that's what Bangkok fears the revival of a long-running separatist movement. This is related to a province called Pat Thani. It's located in the southern part of the country. This is a map of Thailand and Malaysia. This is the border between the two countries. You see these three border provinces? They're collectively called the Pat Thani region. And they are the site of a separatist movement. A violent movement which has reportedly claimed over 7,000 lives since 2004. Why? Because despite being Thai provinces, they are home to mostly ethnic Malay people. 88% of the people here follow Islam. This is according to the Thai census of 2014. So, this region is dominated by Malaysian Muslims. But it's now part of the Buddhist kingdom of Thailand. How did that happen? The short answer is the British. Malaysia was part of the British colonial empire. It was called British Malaya. The region bordered the Kingdom of Siam, the predecessor to modern-day Thailand. The British signed a treaty with the kingdom in the year 1909. It's called the Anglo-Siamese or Bangkok Treaty of 1909. In this, the British recognized Siam's control over today's Patani region. Why? Because it's the British. Trade was more important than ensuring a stable border. Money was given priority over culture and traditions, so they drew borders as they deemed fit. The result is this, decades of religious tensions in the Pattani region. Bangkok says the provinces are an integral part of Thailand, and they're right. Legally, the borders negotiated with Britain are valid, and any calls for redrawing those borders, any talk of independence, is unlawful. Which brings us back to the activists. They know the laws, so they didn't directly ask for independence. Instead, they asked if a referendum should be held, and if the people of Pattani have the right to self-determination. This has raised red flags. The administration is up in arms. They've instituted a crackdown and an investigation. A top military commander called the summit a threat to Thailand's territorial integrity and national security. Ruling party officials want the politicians who attended the summit to be probed. These politicians have now distanced themselves from the event. Any leader who's asked says the same thing. They want to put the insurgency in the region to rest. They want peace through dialogue with separatists. That independence can never be the answer. This is a common story across the world. Britain or any other colonial power causing problems that last generations. Wherever the West had their colonies, 
instability persists in their wake. And speaking of problems that last for generations, let's talk about climate change. Parts of India and Pakistan are bracing for a major cyclone. The UK recently reported a heat wave. Supercharged typhoons, wildfires and droughts have become commonplace. We see the news, we know the risks and we often wonder, what can we as individuals do about it? Well, 16 American children are showing the way. They're in the US state of Montana and they're making history. They filed a case against their government over the climate crisis. They've sued the state of Montana and it's the first such case ever to go to trial in the US. Its outcome could have implications beyond America, though. It could empower more people across the world to hold their government accountable for climate change. Here's a report. They say children are the future. But what future are we leaving behind for children? One riddled with extreme weather events where constant greenhouse gas emissions lead to irreversible climate change? Well, some children have refused this future and are fighting to protect the environment. We're talking about a group of 16 children from the US state of Montana. They have sued the state government for its fossil fuel friendly policies and they're actually being heard in court. In 2020, this group of children filed the lawsuit. They were between 2 and 18 years old at the time. They cited Montana's state constitution. The constitution guarantees the right to a clean and healthful environment. Yes, that's written into Montana's constitution. And the children say that the state government is blatantly ignoring that clause. Montana has the largest coal reserves in the US and it has promoted the coal mining industry over the years. An example is a law passed in May. It limits the effectiveness of environmental regulators. It stops them from assessing the climate impacts of proposed fossil fuel projects, like coal mines or power plants. Obviously, this makes it easier for companies to flout environmental rules. The 16 children from Montana are fighting to highlight this, because the lawsuit itself does not really have a solution. Even if the children win the case, the court will only be able to issue a declaratory judgment, meaning it can say that the state's constitution was violated, but the court cannot formulate new laws. That remains in the hands of politicians. So this lawsuit will not be able to stop Montana's poor climate practices. And yet the government is fighting back hard, using every tactic possible. First, there was slander. The state called the lawsuit a mere publicity stunt, a waste of taxpayer money, aimed at shutting down responsible energy development. Then Montana tried to get the case dismissed, first completely, then partially. But it didn't work. Then they took it to Montana's Supreme Court last week. This was a bid to delay the trial, but none of it helped. The trial has begun. It'll last two weeks. The judge will then produce the verdict. Experts say that Montana is unlikely to accept criticism, that it will make an appeal to a higher court, even if it's only a declaratory judgment. After all, fossil fuel companies won't want a negative outcome in such a high-profile case. It may pave the way for more such lawsuits across the US and the world, which is what the children ultimately want. Even if the Montana court can't undo the damage caused by their government, it can serve as a precedent a rallying cry for environmentalists everywhere, one they can use in the next fight against the fossil fuel industry. For our next story, we're taking you to the Netherlands. It's a small country in Europe, home to around 17 million people, and they're all under threat. Not by an imposing neighbor or a brutal terrorist organization, but by the sun's rays. And the government has come out with a plan to protect them free sunscreen. It may sound frivolous, but it's a serious situation. The cases of skin cancer are on the rise in this country and sunscreen is their first line of defense. So this is what the government plans to do. Install sun cream dispensers across the country in schools, in universities, in parks, at festivals and other public spaces. These will be a lot like sanitizer dispensers that you saw almost everywhere during the pandemic and since then. For the Netherlands, this is a major health initiative. The country faces record levels of skin cancer. We are talking about one in six Dutch people developing skin cancer. One in six people. 
The reason is UV rays or ultraviolet rays. Overexposure to such rays, mostly from the sun, leads to skin cancer. But the sun is not the only source. There are artificial sources too, like sun lamps or tanning beds. Their rays damage skin cells. They trigger the formation of abnormal cells. And these are cancerous cells. They divide rapidly. They spread rapidly. And in some cases, they can be deadly. Skin cancer can be deadly in some cases. So the Dutch government's move is a step in the right direction. Hopefully, it will also change mindsets. You see, across the world, sunscreen is treated like a cosmetic product. It carries a heavy tax. It's often also seen as a luxury product. But increasingly, it is proving to be essential. The Dutch move may set a precedent for others to follow. Because skin cancer is on the rise across Europe. More than 7 million Europeans are estimated to have it. Look at the case of Germany. Germany is a neighbour of the Netherlands. It has seen a 55% increase in deaths from skin cancer, 55% increase in the past two decades. Also, skin cancer, you would know, is of several types. The most serious type is called melanoma. And melanoma has claimed about 60,000 European lives in 2020. But of course, skin cancer is not limited to Europe. And it's a myth that only white people are at risk. People of all ethnicities and colours can be affected. The highest rates of melanoma, in fact, are observed in Australia and New Zealand. This is followed by Western Europe, Northern America, Northern Europe, and then Africa and Asia. So far, so depressing. But here's something encouraging too. Most cases of skin cancer are preventable. All you need is sun protection. And most experts agree that all of us need it all year round. But we need it especially during late spring and early summer. That's when harmful UV rays are the strongest. So perhaps it's time you spoke to your doctor and picked what's best for you. Have you ever been squished into a tight plane seat? Do you curse inadequate leg room on flights or fellow passengers who willfully recline their thrones? If yes, then this story is for you, because we get it. Uncomfortable airplane seats can make even a short journey to paradise feel like forever. But here's some good news. The future of air travel may look very different. I'm talking about economy class bunk beds and double-decker seats. Also increased accessibility for passengers with wheelchairs. Our next report tells you what your seat could look like. Look at these purple-lit pods with pillows and eye masks awaiting on each bed. They look much more like the bunks you would find on European trains, except with more of a space-age vibe. In fact, these pods look like they belong in a sci-fi movie. But they could soon be front and center in the aisle of the economy section of Air New Zealand. Yes, New Zealand's national carrier is taking good sleep to the skies. Now, decent shut-eye is a privilege on any flight, one that is reserved for those who can afford seats in business or first class. But the lie-flat seats are flat out of reach for most of the passengers. And this is an attempt to change that. It's a concept called SkyNest, the first of its kind. It reimagines economy class seating and offers not only bunk beds in the skies, but also a glimmer of hope to its sleep-starved passengers. And this isn't a futuristic concept. It's set to hit the skies in 2024, with each bunk costing about $250 to $380 for every four hours. But purple pods aren't the only seating innovation that's underway. There are other ways to ride the wind. And a 23-year-old airplane seat designer has a few ideas. His name is Alejandro Nunes Vincente, and he believes that double-decker flying is the future of economy seating. Basically, two rows of seats with one on top of the other. This innovation has made a lot of buzz and garnered a mixed response. Would you sit directly below a fellow passenger on a flight? Sounds odd, right? Some say it makes a case for potential claustrophobia. Others say this design will only help companies. They will cram more seats on the plane. But then there are some who are more than willing to try it out, saying that it optimizes space inside the flight. And while the lack of sleep and comfort are two major factors ailing flyers, another key issue is poor accessibility. 
Many times, wheelchairs are damaged in flights. U.S. airlines on average mishandle about 10,500 mobility devices annually. They damage about 1.5 wheelchairs for every 100 flown. A well-known disability activist even died due to this. She developed complications after she rented a wheelchair because her custom wheelchair was destroyed during a United Airlines flight. And this isn't just an American problem. Experts say while data may be lacking, this problem is all pervasive. But now there may be a solution. A new airplane seat debuted this month. It allows travelers to remain in their own wheelchairs during flights. These wheelchairs would attach to the flight seats and passengers will be able to use the airplane's headrest and tray tables. This innovation is being called a crucial step forward. It's also economical. Reports say that wheelchair-bound passengers spend over $58 billion on travel annually. Moves like this will make it a win-win for both sides. Moral of the story, air travel is changing. Seating innovation is taking to the skies. And soon enough, we'll know if these ideas fly in the real world. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Starting with the U.S., tens of thousands of dead fish washed up at beaches in Texas. Officials say low oxygen levels in warm water has led to the situation. Meanwhile, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket delivered 72 spacecraft to orbit. It has now returned to Earth. And South Korea's capital Seoul is marking the 10th anniversary of its famous K-pop band, BTS. Landmarks across Seoul were illuminated in the band's signature color purple. And finally, what makes this day significant, June the 13th? We're taking you back in history. And this is a rather somber story. On this day in 1997, a fire broke out in a movie theater in India's capital, Delhi. You may have heard of the Upahar Cinema Fire. This happened during the screening of a famous Bollywood film. The theater had only one functional emergency exit. More than 50 people were killed. We're leaving you with this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Coming to UK PM. Well, it's not like that we are going to get the Kohinu back. <laughs> <laughs> but at least India is on its way to the top, huh? But Gautam sir, there's actually not much to celebrate. Why not? An Indian is ruling the UK. Indian leaders in third countries often tend to overcompensate for their minority handicap. Key. For example, Sunak's Home Secretary of Indian origin, Suela Brahman, disapproved of India-UK free trade because it would encourage people immigrating to the UK and the majority of whom were Indians. Structurally, India and UK have passed baggage, but still hasn't been resolved. 
and that is why ladies and gentlemen india needs to significantly temper its expectations from rishi sunak presenting vantage with me palki sharma a first of its kind global show with an indian perspective mismanaged vaccination drive broken healthcare systems citizens taking matters into their own hands india's failure in managing the covid-19 crisis is staggering one story is but without the west spin on it presenting vantage with me palki sharma a first of its kind global show with an indian perspective